good and basic podcast, a long-form conversation about the projects on our YouTube channel, why we do them, also interspersed with other occasional philosophic meanderings. Doing a long-form conversation like this allows us to go more into depth on these things in a better and more complex way. Well, better in some sense, right? The videos are super good. The, the videos are super good, but, you know, the, the nice thing about a long-form conversation is it allows us to not know exactly where we're going, but in a productive way. Yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say that's definitely true, right? A, a good traveler... too has to be encapsulated where there's a beginning, middle, end, and we know exactly what it's saying. Or a good something. traveler has no set plans and is not intent on arriving. There's, there's a little dose of Lao Tzu this morning. Um, so you can find all those videos at youtube.com slash goodandbasic. Also, if you're listening to this podcast on YouTube, go ahead and check the video description, and you can find a link to a variety of podcast sites where you can listen to this in audio. Um, we'd also encourage you to check out our Twitter, twitter.com slash goodandbasic, and uh, our Instagram, Twitter, excuse me, not twitter.com, that's, that would be wrong. Um, our Instagram is uh, instagram.com slash, the, the, the handle is good underscore and underscore basic, where somehow we have contrived to get 77 followers without posting anything until this morning. Yep. So, so thank you very much for your support if you're some of those Instagram followers, and if not, go ahead and check it out. We're uh, pretty excited about uh, expanding into both of those platforms, so uh, that should be good. Um, of course, we have here for the podcast, I'm Joseph Fisher, and um, then we have here also in the studio my co-host for the YouTube channel, Joseph Bjork. So uh, welcome, Joseph. Thank you. And welcome to me too. So here we are. Um, so today, 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 we are going to be talking about some of the bushcraft stuff mostly that we did. Uh, when we went to Europe last month, we visited... Gosh, what was the formal name of it? The Bushcraft it the, 2019 UK... It was the Bushcraft Show 2019. Bushcraft Show 2019. Um, yes, and so, you know, it, it, tons of booths with everything from, you know, here we're roasting a whole hog on a spit, so if you'd like a pulled pork sandwich, here is your pulled pork sandwich from a from a pig carcass that has been roasting all this morning, right? Yep. Um, ranging to, uh, you know, there were people carving out a dugout canoe, there were archaeologists, there was uh, Ben Orford sharpening knives, which is kind of his standard operating procedure is my understanding. Um, tons and tons and tons of stuff. So we've been posting some of those videos and we want to talk about a few of them particularly. Um, Joseph, you've been chewing on this for a while. Do you want to kind of launch things off where, 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 what, what called your attention about these, about these videos, bull carving, spring, pull, lathe, uh, spring weaving, sprung weaving, spring weaving. There seems to be a disagreement. Well, the, the, I think it's the American pronunciation is we've been getting the vowels wrong. Oh, yes, that's oh, <laughs> oh, okay. The, um, gosh, the, I'm tempted to start with the videos that we did this week and then launch into, uh, kind of the, the narrative story of how we came to film these. Yeah, go ahead. And then we'll see how that goes. So the first, uh, thing, um, this week we posted a video on how to carve bowls. We saw a very neat demonstration where a gentleman from woodlands.co.uk carved a bowl right in front of us uh, using axes, adzes, chisels, um, and basic, super basic tools. And it was really cool. He'd actually made the axe himself. So that was cool. That was wood carving. Then we posted a video that we filmed with Ben Orford where we saw a demonstration on knife sharpening and also saw got a chance to try out a shave horse for the first time, which was tremendously cool, together with a draw knife. And then there's the video on sprung weaving which is an ancient form of weaving that basically only uses warp fibers. It doesn't use a weft fiber. Instead, you interlace the warp strands to basically create something like chain link fencing. Mm -hmm. And then the last video we're posting this week um, is the video on the spring pole wave, which, funny enough, was actually part the highlight of the trip for me. Yeah, actually, why, why don't we why don't we talk about that, right? So we did crazy stuff on the trip. We camped out in Sherwood Forest. Um, you know, we, we visited the Netherlands where you lived for two years. Uh, we visited the Wallace collection in London. Like we did a lot of really cool stuff. So, so why is it that the spring pole lathe stood out to you? Stood out. Um, why, why, why do you identify that as, I know, I'm not asking you to make a formal ranking, right? But why did that stand out to you as a, as you know, top three at least? Uh, well, it stands out. Maybe that's the best okay. way to say stands it. Out. Stands out. So, so why is that? Um, for one thing, it's something I've wanted to try for a long time, and then the opportunity unexpectedly presented itself. And so since it was unexpected and long-desired, I mean, that's a very pleasant surprise. Pleasant surprises are easy to remember. 
And then in addition to that, um, the actual experience of working with that lathe was so cool because it required all of my focus in order to, I mean, you're, you're adjusting little things like the angle of your hands have to be very precise and you're watching this whirring, moving thing, but you're only cutting half the time when it's spinning toward you. Mm -hmm. And so you're having to, you can't zone out at any time. You're always pulling the tool in or putting it back in place, pulling it in and precisely putting it back in place and yeah. try not to let the edge catch. And so it engages your attention. The brain is fully engaged. In addition to that, it is a full body engaged sort of thing as well mm -hmm. um, because you're tapping your foot up and down and that's building the rhythm that you're having to match your hands to and so you're balancing on one foot moving what the other foot to power the device and then your hands are constantly moving to make these precise cuts and so it was all my head and all my body at the same time focused on one task and that hmm. to me was incredibly cool hmm. your whole mind your whole body all together coordinated focusing on one task yes and it was, I mean, you focusing everything together that way could be incredibly stressful mm -hmm. if it was pushing you like beyond the edges yeah, yeah, of your yeah, ability yeah. and you felt like you were falling behind. Um, but it didn't feel that way. It was meditative. It was really nice to be able to focus entirely in a creative, constructive moment. So that was, that was, it was zen. It was awesome. Yeah. 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 That, so first of all, that's really cool. Second of all, as, as you were describing that, I was thinking about how there's a lot of things that I do that challenge my mind or challenge my body, but that I don't really think of as challenging both. Right. So for instance, if I were to run a marathon, which, uh, I, I could do given enough time, right. Anyone can run a marathon given enough time, right. They might have to walk it, but they could do it. Right. And I, and I, and I thought, you know, that would push me to the limits of my physical endurance. Right. And we'll probably be on them. Right. But cognitively speaking, all I'm saying is all my brain is saying is, you know, put one foot in front of the other. Right. Um, conversely, you know, if I were to go back and try to polish up my math skills, right. Uh, that's going to be an intensely cerebral activity. Right. My mind is going to be going into overdrive. Right. Yeah. But my body is going to be uh, digesting food and breathing, you know, <laughs> pretty, pretty low stress stuff. Sure. Right. And, and so it's remarkable to me to to find something to find something in bushcraft to find something in uh in craftsmanship and wood carving right i'm trying to identify it more precisely right um that incorporates both those aspects of the human experience and integrates them right I, where it's a thing that is fully involving your mind and fully involving your body and that then you get that incredibly satisfying uh feeling out of it yeah that's really cool yeah i i would identify it as the creative arts so because you're in the moment of creating something, I mean, they're, they're, you're creating a material thing. You're creating a physical object. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, because you're having to plan out what you're doing next, I mean, that's mental. But what I liked about the spring pool lathe is, is how it was even more physical than, say, drawing or regular carving. Mm -hmm. Because it Oh, yeah, was like your foot is involved, everything. Yeah. And you there, know, there's I'm, multiple parts I'm balancing of your body. on one foot while carving something at high speed. I mean, that was really cool. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Well, and the other thing it makes me think is that, you know, so, so you're in law school. Yes. I just wrapped up a, a graduate degree in English and both of those don't involve our bodies that much, right? We sit in classrooms, we walk around, we open our mouths and talk, right? We type on a keyboard. There's just not a lot of intense physical activity for these things, right? Yep. And that's broadly true for graduate degrees, um, you know, and broadly true for higher education in general, right? With a few exceptions, but generally speaking, right? Yep. Um, and anyway, I was just thinking that that seems to be, gosh, uh, an unfortunate, an unfortunate weakness of higher education. And um, something you just said, something about how, like, you know, it's it's uh, that it's the creative arts. What I I, I just want to share this thought. What I what I thought of a moment ago is I was like, okay, so, all right, Joseph. Sorry, this time I'm talking to myself. Uh, <laughs> All right, Joseph, you just did a master's of English. So what were you creating physically? And the answer actually came to me myself, right? That's what you're creating across time. Hopefully, it, you know, if you're doing higher education the right way, if you're doing these cerebral activities in the right way that you're conceptualizing them as I am creating myself across time. Yeah. And that's anyway, that's quite an interesting thought. Um, you know, what, what a lot of things that we think about and talk about are, you know, the woes and advantages uh, conversely speaking of, of higher education. Right. And so it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's, not, it's interesting to think about that anyway. Yeah. You know, that actually reminds me when, when I first 
so my first year in the in the law program, uh, yeah. we lived in a place that was up a hill from where I went to school, and at the time I was still uh, basically kind of doing self physical therapy to recover from a crash, mm-hmm. and so you know I'd I'd snapped my femur before, and I was walking was harder than it should be, mm-hmm. and you know that was it was funny that at school that there isn't any physical therapy aspect to it, but getting to and from school there was. And so, I mean, maybe there's some poetry there. Like, mm-hmm. you hear old stories about uh, your grandparents walking five miles to school each way, where, for one thing, it's a sacrifice that shows how much you want school. Yeah. And or how much your parents want you to be going to school. Some combination of the above. Some combination of the above. But, um, you know, it adds adds some of that physical element where there's some sacrifice and also some physical gain from going. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and... Yeah, I don't know. It's a, it's a it's a thing we're thinking about. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a thing we're thinking about as we as we muse on higher education. I'm interested uh, in briefly talking about the the story of how we came to go to the Bushcraft show, and then you had a very interesting point about two yes. of the videos that we filmed this week. Yes, yes, this yes, week. yes, yes. And I want to yeah, go ahead, go ahead. So briefly, the story we weren't actually planning to go to the Bushcraft show. Um, that was serendipitous. We were told about the Bushcraft show while doing a bronze casting workshop with Will Ward. Jay, thank you for that recommendation. And uh, the opportunity was available, and we had a day that was mostly empty. We shuffled the stuff on our schedule, and we were able to go. And I am so grateful we went because mm-hmm. there was a lot of good stuff there. So anyway, serendipity, that's the story of how we got yeah, there. Yeah, well, once again, a good traveler has no set plans and is not intent on arriving. If you're always <laughs> focusing on what it is that you want, sometimes you miss the most important good things. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad we went up to the Bushcraft show too. It was a wonderful day. We met some wonderful people and, you know, I think I'll, probably all of our listeners will agree the videos are pretty cool. Yeah. Right. Uh, I'd wait until you see next week. Wait until you see next week. Um, I, I guess this week at the time of posting, right? Um, do, 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 do. So the two videos. Yes. 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 Okay. So, so here is an interesting thing. Um, here's an interesting thing. It mostly centers around the bowl carving one and the spring pull lathe. I think... Um, and also one from next week. Um, yeah, that I'm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, okay, let's so let's tease that one just a little bit. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. This is the. This is the. So uh, this week, um, at, at, at the time of, at the time you're listening to this podcast, this week one of the videos that we're going to post is at the Bushcraft Show. There was an archaeologist, a, a group of student archaeologists, who uh, one of them was skinning a deer carcass with a piece of flint, right? So he's skinning a deer with a rock. And and as soon as I saw that on the, you know, they, they had that uh, the, the pamphlet thing with the schedule and all the activities. And as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh man, that is going to be so awesome. That is going to be so cool. And it didn't disappoint, right? Like you have, you're skinning an animal with a rock, right? Like, can you get more hardcore than that? And the answer is, well, probably not. Um, right. And what, what stood out to me though, is so I was watching this guy skin a deer with a rock, right? And the thought that actually came to my mind, I, I've never skinned an animal. The closest I've ever come to skinning an, an animal is gutting a fish, right? Uh, far cry from, from you know, skinning a deer carcass, right? Different, different ball game. As I was watching that guy skin the deer carcass, the thought that leapt to my mind was, I could do that. Like, I, I could skin a deer with a rock. That is tremendously cool. Yeah, and, and my first skinning would be a little messy. You know, there would be chunks of sinew and meat that I improperly separated so they'd be stuck to the hide and I might accidentally rip or make some holes in the hide, right? Like I would not do a a really good job the first time around, but I could do it. And at the end I would have a skin and a carcass and I would have done it with a rock. And, and so what, what, what stood out to me about that was the fact that like, um, we, we live, it, it, it was, it was, I think a, a, sort of a conceptual adjustment from the way that I think about a lot of things in the modern world. And the way I think about a lot of things in the modern world is hands off, don't touch. That's technical. That requires experts. Right. And a lot of what we do on this channel seems to be, you know, one of the things that we're both very interested in is pushing the boundaries of that and saying, well, I could be an expert in that, or at least I could do a good enough job. Right. So one of the places where this pops up is of course, like computers, you know, I, I, I there are so few pieces of my computer that I could repair you know if like the little rubber feet come off the bottom i can glue those back on i'm comfortable dipping into sort of the top layer of software right but when you get down into like the the assembly language and the hardware components i'm like i could not make those hardware components and i i spend a week 
you know, playing around with assembly language. And, and, and I have nothing but the greatest respect for the humans who put computers together yeah. on that first layer of programming. It's insane. There's, there's a danger that if you do uh, play with the program and try to fix things on oh. your computer, you're, there's a fear that you will mess it up irreparably well, uh, while almost, trying to fix it. Almost a knowledge uh, once you get down to that level, right? And, and even, but yeah, even on the top layers of software, right? Um, yeah, that fear that you'll mess it up irreparably, right? Which is one of the reasons why, you know, you don't, well, and people have this fear about their cars, you know? Yeah. Oh, I don't want to fix my own car. I don't want to, I don't want to give it to the experts, you know? Um, and so it was really interesting for me to look at, you know, uh, a student archaeologist, right? He's pursuing a graduate degree in archaeology. You know, he's, he's the closest thing to an expert I've ever found on this. And I looked at what he did and I thought I could do that. Yeah. Right. The distance between me and him was actually very small. So it was really cool. And it made me think it made me, it made me sort of, it sort of like revived my faith in one of our deep goals, which is to reduce, roughly speaking, to reduce the difference between amateur and expert, to reduce the distance as much as possible. To make it um, accessible. To yeah, to make it, it accessible. To the level of something yeah. that can be uh, uh, re reproduced. Yeah. And then it also made me think, okay, you know, what other things that I'm looking at, what other things could I do? Yeah. Perhaps not really well the first time around, but what could I do? And then, and then at the end I would say, yeah, like I... I did this thing and it, and it was good and I have something to show for at the end. You, you had a similar response to the bowl carving video. Do you want to talk about that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so the same thing with the bowl carving. I was watching uh, that gentleman carve bowls, which was really cool. And I, I was looking at the whole thing and I was like, you know, man, wouldn't it be cool to have, you know, a set of 20 hand carved wooden bowls that you made, right? And you just, you know, you eat your cereal out of your own hand carved wooden bowl, right? That would be really cool. And, and it wouldn't be that hard, right? So, and, and I thought about it and I thought, okay, if I had his tools... I could make a really, a really crappy bowl, right? It would not look very nice, but on my first go around, I could probably make a bowl or at least half a bowl. It might crack, you know? Um, but within a few tries, I'd be making bowls and they wouldn't be like marvelous works of art, but they would be bowls. They would work and they would be mine. And forever after I would look at them and be like, oh, you know, look at that, Joseph, you know, look how accomplished you are. You, you made a bowl, right? And if someone cracked the bowl, I'd be like, that's okay. Next time I'm watching a movie, I'll just carve another one. Yeah. Right. And so it was re remarkably empowering, right? Remarkably empowering to look at those things and say, I could do that. And, and I think that's a major idea undergirding our channel, right? The, the, you know, what you said to make it accessible, right? To be able to look at all these things and say, I could do that. Yeah. Right. And I had the same reaction with the, with the spring pole lathe, uh, n namely that, uh, you know, if you walk through these antique buildings and you see the, the posts and the banisters and railings, you know, and I used to think, oh, you know, how do you do that? Right. And then I learned about lathes and I was like, man, that's so smart. That's a really cool way to, to, to make those, to make those decorative poles, right. The decorative posts. Um, and you know, as I was watching you do the spring pole lathe work on the spring pole lathe, right. I was thinking, you know, that looks like a post for a banister or railing, you know, and it's, is it very good? It's, it's okay. You know, it's not, it's not the peak of the craftsman's art, but it's recognizable. Yeah. Right. It's like when uh, when you're drawing something and, you know, you ask someone else to identify what it was and, and they say it's an elephant and you say, drat, I was trying to draw a hat or whatever. Um, if Even if I draw an elephant badly, if I can draw it to the level where, uh, where other human beings are able to recognize it and say, oh, that's an elephant. It's not a very well-drawn elephant, but at least I know what it is that you were attempting to yeah. accomplish. And so, I mean, you look at the, at the, the post, the, mm -hmm. the turned item, and you're able to say, oh, that is a, maybe it's uh, not a well executed, whatever that was, but you know, I can tell what it is. Mm -hmm. And it would be semi-functional in that capacity. Yes. A chair leg, maybe. Right. Uh, yeah. And you know, and, and then I started thinking, uh, I was thinking about the bowls and I was like, okay, you know, Joseph, you could just go to a dollar store and get a bowl for a dollar, right? Get 20 bowls for $20. And in terms of, you know, in terms of what you could get paid to do work, you know, in terms of pure dollars, the cost benefit analysis says go buy your bowls from the dollar store. Right. But then I, I thought about the empowerment and satisfaction for making my own bowls. And I was like, no, that's a pretty good trade off. You know, if I'm watching a movie, I'm just going to be sitting there anyway. I may as well, you know, get good enough that I can carve a bowl while, while I watch a movie. That sounds like a really worthwhile thing to do that would genuinely enrich my life, even if the dollar value doesn't check out. And, and the dollar value would be close enough that, that it that would be worth it. Yeah. Right. So I wonder, I think there's all sorts of areas in our lives where we've improperly done the cost benefit analysis because we've only factored in dollars. And actually, 
if we really thought about it, we'd say, no, I want to hand carve my own bowls. It sounds like we've got two major ideas here. The first one being, is it worth doing by hand and, and investing in the creative process for its own sake? And the second one is, is the earlier idea mentioned with skinning the deer and also with uh, the, the bone carving, uh, sorry, the bowl carving. And that is, uh, how, many, how many prerequisites are there before you can enter the art? And for some of these crafts, it seems like that is much lower than with stuff like, say, your car or your computer, where it seems like you need to you already want to know a thing or two before you start messing yeah. with it. Whereas bowl carving is something that you can do now badly, mm -hmm. but recognizably, yeah. with almost no barriers to entry. I mean, if you have a hatchet, you can start bowl carving. Yeah. Well, and, and I think about that because I've done some repairs on my car because I was interested in doing that. I'm thinking of one particular one. Uh, so the engine check light is on, I check the error codes, right? And as far as I can tell, probably the right thing to do is to replace the oxygen sensors. Um, oh no, sorry, hang on, I'm telling the story wrong. Um, let's see, what was the order? No, the first thing that I tried was I actually took apart half the engine and um, and I took off the top half of the engine basically and, and, and resealed, I replaced the gasket so that it would be airtight because there's too much air getting into the fuel air mix, right? And that didn't do anything, right? And then I uh, replaced the oxygen sensors, and that didn't do anything. And those were supposed to be the things that would probably make it work. After that, what? So the oxygen sensors were, I think, like sixty bucks. Replacing the gaskets was like another fifty bucks, right? Plus, you know, all the time that I invested in that, right? So I wasted a lot of money not fixing my engine, basically. And what it ended up being was I had to replace the air filter, which is the thing I should have thought at the beginning. And those air filters cost like ten bucks and you can replace them in about five minutes. And I was kind of kicking myself after that, right? But I thought about it and I was like, well, you know, was that the most financially effective thing for me to do? And the answer was not really. Uh, but somehow I don't regret it. Like I took apart half my engine and then put it back together and the car ran. You yeah. know, it actually ended up being much more accessible than, you know, than I was led to believe, right? Oh, don't touch your engine. Don't take it apart, right? And, and you know, if you do that, do it with appropriate caution for sure right but i did it it, and it, it became worked. accessible yeah. it was this big scary thing that is supposed to supposedly off limits that you can't you you can't mess with you can't yeah. learn from you can't you can't into hmm. what's the word uh you you can't uh what I'm looking for a word like you can't connect with what I want to say is what I want to say is you can't enter into it's just this domain there's an impermeable boundary between you and it and yeah the engine's over there and you're over here and, and man, you don't touch that thing. I want to say integrate interface. I'm not I, I wonder if those are the, well, yeah, I don't know. I yeah. can't say for sure. Well, bring um, within your sphere of confidence. I, I had a similar thing. I replaced my own brakes once and I broke the, I broke one of the springs on the brake. So I had to replace the whole brake, which was stupid and annoying. Right. And, and cost me like, I can't remember like 40 bucks. Right. Plus all the time da, 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 and my car was out of action and stuff, right? But somehow I still don't regret that either because now I have knowledge, right? Like, and it, failures, if they're not catastrophic, are really beneficial because they actually do give you knowledge. So, so I just, I, I, I think, you know, the lesson that I learned from, from fixing my car in that respect was, hey, you know, things are a lot more accessible than you think they are. They're a lot more accessible than they look and they're worth trying to dig into. Yeah. They're worth doing. You know, with your bowl carving analogy, there's there's something interesting there. Because if you carve the bowls and you make the bowls, then if one of the bowls breaks, it doesn't matter as much as if you bought them. Because there's part of you that says, I have mastery over uh -huh. this in such a way that, oh. oh, I can make another one. Okay. Yeah, sorry, finish. But and this is really interesting. Th there seems to be a tie-in again with the car, where after you fixed this part on the car, suddenly the idea of that part breaking is no longer scary because it's within your sphere of competence and you can now... Yeah fix it. Now that is a really interesting In idea. You own it more. Yeah. Well, and th this is what's so interesting to me about that is the way that you described, you know, if I go buy my bowls and then they break, it's just, it's a failure. It's a flat loss. Yeah. Right. Whereas if I had carved my own wood bowls, I would feel, I would not feel like it was a failure. I would feel like it was a partial loss and partial gain. Right. And that's so interesting because, um, you know, okay, so I'm going to speak very, very, very broadly and unprecisely un for just a second. But in general, you know, there's two things that can happen when you try something. You either succeed or you fail, very broadly speaking, right? And if you succeed, then that's super awesome. And if you fail, well, you know, that's kind of a bummer, right? But if you can figure out a way to make the failure successes, well, then look at what happens. If you succeed, you succeed. And if you fail, you succeed. 
right? So, so the best kind of strategic position you can be in is the kind where even if you lose, you win. Heads I win, tails you lose. Exactly. And if you can wiggle yourself into that kind of position, hey, that's a really good place to be. Yeah. So, so this is actually really interesting to me because it suggests that there's something like, oh, I, I want to say like deeply metaphysically right about carving your own wood bowls. Yeah. In, I, I, the, the idea needs some more explanation and sussing out, right? But that there's something deeply metaphysically correct about it because if you fail, you still win to a greater degree than if you bought your bowls and they break. Yeah. Gosh, that's interesting. You know, it, it's so interesting to me that I, well, for one thing, the, the thing that I really liked about uh, the Spring Pole Wave was that feeling of mind-body connection. It was, it was my mind, my body, mm -hmm. and the external world all connecting very tightly in a specific moment of time. Yeah. And that was tremendously cool. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, in a way, the thing that made it cool was feeling more connected with with the world with mm -hmm. this thing that i'm working on like and all the things are being with myself together. at the same time i'm not alienated from my body i'm not alienated from the from the environment i'm not alienated from the wood i i'm there's a bringing together of all these disparate elements mm -hmm. and they're all connected for a moment they're harmonized harmonized that is yeah. a really good word for it yeah i i, I think so especially because like harmony suggests that things are different but linked in a good way yes Right. Working together, compatible, whatever yeah. that happens to be. Independently good and also creating a greater whole. And when you carve your own bowls and or can fix your own brakes and or can take your entire engine apart and replace O2 sensors and gaskets, yeah, um, you, you are more connected uh, both in that moment to your car and also across time with your car. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. No, oh, gosh, that's exactly right. Like, I think that's exactly right. And, you know... Something that, you know, one of the, I guess, central complaints about modernity, right, is how fragmented it feels, right? How pulled apart we feel and how scattered everything feels and you can't pull yourself together, yeah. right? And this is, I think, you know, at least part of the reason why things like yoga and meditation and mindfulness and all that stuff, you know, like being one with the universe or whatever, you know, all this sort of new age stuff, a lot of the drive for it seems to be that sense of uh, I am seeking a harmony, yeah. I'm, I'm seeking a harmony of myself that I can get all my pieces lined up, the pieces of me lined up into something coherent, and then also line myself up coherently with the world around me. Yes. Right. And, uh, man, apparently you can get that with a spring pole lathe. Yeah. You know? I want so, to... And then at the end, you know, not, not talking smack about yoga or anything. I've, I've, I, I like yoga. But... Um, but I, I just think that's so interesting that we're like, oh, you need to go to the East. You need to do yoga. You need to do mindfulness practice. And it's like... You know, or you could just use a spring pole lathe. Yeah. It's just interesting to see other paths. And so it makes you wonder, it makes you first of all say, oh, that's cool. There's another path to this. And then it also makes you wonder, what are all the other things like car repair, for example, that yeah. I could turn into that? Or motorcycle maintenance? Or motorcycle maintenance. Yes. So uh, Piercic has been lurking on the on the edges of this conversation yes, for a while, has. hasn't he? <laughs> so th there are two books that I, I think need to be brought into the conversation. One of them is Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Piercic, mm -hmm. which is a classic from the 70s on, on, on basically this. It's on the, the Zen to be found in fixing a motorcycle and traveling and integrating these all these things so that they align around quality. Yeah. And then the other book, uh, which is more modern and frankly, it's more accessible, um, is called uh, Shop Class as Soulcraft by Michael Crawford. If I'm not mistaken, don't quote me on that, on the name. Shop, sure. Is it Shopcraft as Soulcraft? Uh, shop Class as Soulcraft. Okay. I thought it was Shopcraft. I, 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 anyway. you, you, th there's a bit of a what would you call this? There's, there's a, there's a bit of background here too, because like, I really like Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance and, and Joseph is very iffy about it. I, I think largely a philosophical rat, but yes. I can't put my finger on it. Yeah. Um, and shop class, shop class of Soulcraft, yes. is what we're thinking it's called, uh, is, is a book that Joseph loves to death and I still haven't read it. So it's not as deep by any stretch of the imagination as Zen and the art of motorcycle maintenance, but it makes some points. Uh, it's about reinvestigating the value of work. Mm -hmm. And it's reinvestigating work specifically for this integration, for this harmony that yeah. we were talking about. He ma makes a, a case study of the, the d way our attitudes toward engines have changed. In the old days on a motorcycle, there used to be a hand-powered pump for your oil. Yeah. So when you were going faster, you squeezed this thing more often on the handlebars yeah, 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 yeah. so that you were providing more oil to the engine. Yeah. And then when you were going slower, you squeezed it less often. And I mean, you were manually pumping oil through your engine. 
Can you imagine Which that? Which is a pretty cool thought, if right? If you like, forget to yeah, pump the oil, I, the engine welds together into a blob and you go flying. I'm, I'm imagining that in a car, right? Like you're driving down you're driving down the freeway and the guy in the passenger seat is just like pumping this 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 piston to get... <laughs> that's a funny mental image. Yeah, yeah. And that was part of it. So, I mean, you are... The, the cost of failure is pretty high. I mean, if yeah. you stop pumping oil to this thing... It's the cost of the machine, practically. It will destroy it. Yeah. And then... But on the other hand, you're, you're more intimately connected with the machine as a whole. Uh-huh. You are the thing that's making it work. I mean, it's not human powered, but it's it's you are required as the user in order to make the thing work. Uh-huh. And then you compare that with, you know, as, as time goes on, Sears catalogs used to have exploded out diagrams of how to fix all the parts in your microwave because it was expected that people would want to know and would expect to integrate themselves with the machine and be able to yeah. fix it and kind of own it. And then as time goes on, I mean, you take it to a repair shop. Nobody knows how the microwave works anymore, unless you're maybe the king of random. And then finally you move to the present day where some cars are being made without dipsticks. Because it is assumed See, that, that even checking me. your oil that gets is me, not man. something that the common person Gosh. is going to be doing at all. And there seems to be something wrong about uh, that. If, if you're all willing to accept the invitation, please go check your oil right now. It will make you feel better inside. Just go find your, uh, you know, open the hood. Find your dipstick, get a paper towel to rub the oil off, and just uh, pull it out, rub the oil off, stick it back in, pull it back out, and take a look. And, and you'll you'll just feel so much better inside. You'll feel so much better inside. And maybe you'll also realize, oh my gosh, that oil is really black. Oh my gosh, I haven't changed my oil. Oh my gosh. Right? And then and then you can fix that too. But if you're willing to accept a, a little invitation, please please go do that right now, and it'll just make your day better, I promise. Yeah, maybe that's the, the takeaway from this <laughs> whole conversation is... Um, uh, no. Maintenance. Actually, you know, the maintenance aspect... J- just um, just one second. I want to mention um, in the video description we're going to... On, on YouTube, and I guess, you know, I'll do, I'll do this on the show notes on Anchor too, is um, leave Amazon affiliate links to both of those books so that you can... Um, so that you can go buy those if you're interested. And, you know, if we can get some kind of buying war going on, then we can figure out if more people on the channel uh, side with me and like Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance or side with Joseph Bjork and like a uh, uh, shop class of Soulcraft. You know, a <laughs> little, little, little friendly rivalry, but... Uh, That's awesome. Um, I still need to a- Anyway, we'll, 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 leave, we'll leave those there. Well, and I still need to read shop class of Soulcraft, right? Like, okay, okay. So maybe there's some bridge building here. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, some, there's some stuff we need to do. Um, but but I'll, leave, I'll leave those links in the description so that um, y'all can go get those books. Um, if, if you're interested, I'll also leave a link. I did a review of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance a while ago on our channel, and I'll link to that video too. Awesome. So, sorry, you were saying. Yeah, um, one of the things uh, that you... Okay, so checking the oil on your car is a way of uh, investing yourself in the machine and kind of taking ownership over its maintenance. Yes. Taking responsibility is a yeah. word that we could use. It's connecting yourself to the external world and saying, I am responsible for this. Huh. Um, in addition to that, that actually ties in the other video from this week, which was uh, the knife sharpening demonstration we saw with Ben Orford. Okay. Where what he does, uh, what he seems to be extremely good at and kind of dedicated toward is the maintenance of tools. Mm-hmm. And actually that brings in your grandpa. Yeah. Talk about Ben Orford a bit and then we'll jump over to my grandpa. Okay. If that's so, okay, so that we don't get too much whiplash here. Ben, ben Orford's channel is dedicated to bushcraft and he runs a website where he sells, runs a business where he sells knives that he makes. And he makes some really cool knives, uh, including a Makatugan, which is a Native American inspired knife that is a crook knife used in a carving motion toward yourself. Um, he makes uh, uh, Scandinavian bevel knives where they have the single bevel and they're, they're extremely sharp makes some really good equipment and he makes videos on how to maintain and take care of these tools where there is personal investment in the tools so that you personally know how to sharpen it you know how to maintain it you know Mm -hmm. what its limits are you become one with the knife um, to make it sound cheesy no but but you're right yeah that's that's fundamentally what you fundamental ownership over it psychic and metaphysical unity between the knife and the self yeah you know take that to your yoga teacher and tell them about it yeah it's it's the same knife sharpening a soul craft or yeah, yeah, knife yeah, yeah, sharpening yeah. and zen or something like yeah. that. Yeah, zen. Yeah, zen and yeah, all the knife maintenance. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah. So so this is interesting too. Um, let's see. Uh, my grandfather who passed away. Goodness, it would have been about a year and a half ago. That's correct. Um, a year and a half ago. Anyway, when when I was growing up, when I was a teenager, I worked with him uh, quite a bit. Um, every Saturday during the summer. And then when I was older, uh, during the week in the summer too. Right. And what we would do is, um, 
it, it's interesting because both portions of the job were maintenance. The first thing we did was um, maintenance of commercial and residential properties. So like lawn mowing, uh, fixing sprinklers, um, trimming hedges, um, building and rebuilding fences, just whatever it was that needed to be done, basically. Right. And then the other portion of it, of course, is that he, you know, to accomplish that task of maintenance, we had to do maintenance on the tools. Right. And so he had this this shop that had just just massive quantities of tools, probably, you know, for, for a one person shop, you know, sort of one person shop. It was it was an impressive array. Right. I think he had like, I don't know, he probably had 20 shovels. Right. And the question is, well, why have 20 shovels? Right. And the answer is part of, part of the answer was, well, you want to make sure that you always have the tool that you need to do the job. Right. You never want to be stuck in the middle of a job and say, I don't have the tool that I need. Right. Um, and, 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 and so there's this, this sort of intimate connection between, between the work he was doing and who he was and, and the tools that he used, right. Such that he was harmonizing or, you know, trying that, that was the effort was to harmonize between all those things perfectly so that he always could do the job well because he had the right tools because he had taken care of them. He was religious about changing oil, wasn't he? Uh, with his cars? Like religious doesn't even begin to describe like religious. You think of going to church every week and, and he was, he was a fanatic. He was a fanatic. There's a story behind that, actually. He grew up on a farm and uh, was out driving his family's tractor, and he didn't change the water in the radiator and burned up the engine. That's a pretty rough thing to do when you're a little kid and your family, you know, needs that tractor to live, right? Um, so he religiously, religiously changed oil. It's, it's, it's with him that I learned to change oil and kind of got into, into, into cars and engines a little bit in the, in the first place. Yeah, so he would religiously change the oil, you know, every... Um, uh, every every fall there was a day set aside where we would uh, you know uh, do do you know switch out the gasoline we'd winterize all the engines and so on and so forth um so yeah he was he was extremely religious about that and and what strikes me most right um is is the mindfulness let's say the mindfulness of all the pieces right of knowing oh okay if i want to use hedge trimmers today i need to make sure that i have 3 of them because i need to make sure because i need two people hedge trimming today and i want to make sure that there's a backup hedge trimmer in case one of them doesn't start or breaks or something goes wrong right okay in order to do that i need to have a fuel oil mix for those hedge trimmers available okay in order to do that i need to have a ton of gas cans and i need to be semi religious about making sure that they're always full and, and so, you know, a lot of times when we do jobs, we just sort of do the job and then go home. And he was very uh, conscientious and religious about doing the job and then doing whatever had to be done after in terms of putting away the tools, um, cleaning them off or doing whatever needed to be done so that they would be ready the next time. Right. So you're not just you're even not just trying to harmonize between the job, the tools and the self. You're trying to harmonize between the jobs, the tool and the self across time so that you can keep doing this into the future. Right. And so that's what strikes me is that mindfulness and that harmonizing across that seems to be centered in this act of maintenance. Yeah. Is that, I, I hope that was more or less what you were trying to yeah, draw. Exactly, out. Okay. Exactly. Um, it, it struck, so I went to this shop once and uh, saw that he had tons and tons and tons of replacement chainsaw blade. Yeah. Who has retain, replacement chainsaw blade? Yeah. Someone who's expecting to repair their own chainsaws. Yeah. More than once. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and yeah, so, so he would make his own chainsaw blades and so forth, you know, like uh, rivet them together, and 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 yeah. So there's a very strong ethos of, of of doing that thing yourself that also seems to be linked to this idea of of maintenance and mindfulness, right? And I, I think you you probably saw also he had like eight chainsaws on the wall, right? And you, you, he passed away when he was ninety, right? So the question is, and actually after he he passed away, and then like four days later in the mail a new chainsaw arrived on his front porch, so. Uh, he he was a bit of a madman in some ways. Like he's he's a crazy guy. He's a crazy interesting guy. Um, but uh, so so why does a ninety year old man need eight chainsaws on his wall? And the answer is because you need backup chainsaws. You need different chainsaws for different jobs. And and the the idea behind all of that is you're trying to harmonize between the task, the tools, the self, and across time. Yeah, that is tremendously cool. Well, I. I think that's probably. Do, a good do you want to, to tell the off. George Washington Carver story? Actually, is that Briefly, okay? Yes. Yeah, because because that's really cool, and it would be a good place to 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 round this off. If that's all right. Absolutely. So there is a apocryphal story which I heard in a children's story about the life of George Washington Carver, who is one of my heroes. 
Um, George Washington Carver was an African-American uh, former slave who became one of the world's most respected scientists. He had the crown prince of Sweden come out to do a multiple week course of study with him. He was advising Mahatma Gandhi and Theodore Roosevelt. He was working with Thomas Edison and Henry Ford on a secret project in the 1930s. He was a genius and uh, an extremely humble, capable man. And one thing that, so this apocryphal story is that he was sent on an errand as a little boy to this big old manor house. And he was kind of raised in a log cabin. So, I mean, very different set of circumstances. And they get, he gets to this uh, manor house and he's led into this waiting room. And in the waiting room, there's an oil painting. He's never seen one before in his life. And he looks up at that oil painting and the, the internal dialogue he has is, he touches the painting and says, the man who made that had hands. I have hands. I can do it too. And just that, uh, that empowerment, that, that, I, that belief that that which other people have done, I can do. And so what does he do? He goes back out to the woods where he plays and he figures out how to make his own paints using uh, oils and natural dyes that he finds in the woods. And he starts painting rocks and trees and everything. And so people in his community start walking through the woods and finding little paintings all over the place <laughs> as he's self-teaching. Um, Men and talk it, about making the world more beautiful. Right? Yeah. And, you know, he becomes, he eventually specializes as a botanist and becomes a scientist, becomes extremely well known for work with uh, sweet potatoes and with peanuts in particular, finds 300 uses for peanuts. But, you know, he had, uh, one of his paintings was an honorable mention in the 1893 World's Fair in Chicago. He's no slouch. He's no. an accomplished artist. He's an accomplished artist who continued to do art projects for the rest of his life. Yeah. And so, I mean, that that's really cool because, you know, you, there's two attitudes you could bring when you see an impressive oil painting. One is, wow, I could never do that. Mm -hmm. And the other one, which is what he had, was, wow, I could do that. Maybe badly at first, but I could do it. Which is what we've said about bowl carving, spring pole lathe, engine repair, skinning Tool animals. Lanes. Who knows what else, right? Yeah. Wow. Seems like a good a place as any to wrap up. Yeah, um, um, this has been a really edifying conversation. So we hope you've enjoyed. It. I I feel I I feel inspired. Like this is good. This has yeah. been good. So good and basic, you might say. Um, yeah. Um, so once again, we want to thank you all for listening. Remind you to go check out the YouTube channel, youtubecom slash basic. Um, if you're listening on YouTube, check the notes, check the video description to get a link to uh, podcasting platforms. Um, there's the Amazon affiliate links for those two books in the description below. Uh, and other assorted links and stuff. So if you want to check that out, please go ahead and check that out. As always, thank you very much for listening. And thank you and see you next time.